Hello, and welcome back to Grasping Scripture. Today, we're going to be tackling 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, finishing out Paul's second letter to Timothy as he served at Ephesus. Well, before we get into that, I want to give a quick shout out to our listeners that join us from Ireland. I uh, looked at the statistics lately, and I see you are the largest uh, non-U.S. group that has been joining us on a consistent basis. And I just want to say welcome. We're glad to have you and glad you're part of this podcast. Well, back to it today. Again, welcome. Glad you're here as part of this as we seek to delve into God's word, to study his word and get a sense for what it says, what it means and how it applies to our lives. So as we prepare our hearts to do that, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we turn to you in this time. Lord, and we ask that you would open your word to us. That as we study this text, you would speak to our hearts by your spirit. That you would give us understanding, wisdom, and discernment as we seek to hear your voice through your word. Lord, not that we would just learn in some academic sense, but that you would truly speak to us, that we would follow you, that we would be challenged by your word to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. Lord, help us to hear you today. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, again, for the background on the text of the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy and how it fits into the larger narrative of Paul's letters to Timothy, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the previous podcast. They'll give you that framework. But this is Paul's, in essence, final words to Timothy that we have in print anyway. Here in the fourth chapter, it completes his final letter to Timothy. So let's look at what he says, starting in verse 1. He says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to us, or excuse me, when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. So there in two verses, Paul lays out the core of it, his charge to Timothy. This is almost a summation of what he has said already over the expanse of these two letters. When he says, look, in the presence of God in Christ, who will someday judge the living and the dead, and the way that's phrased is referring back to Christ, will judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. And now that's the framework. Now what's the charge? And this is a charge that applies to us as to us too. I believe it applies to all believers, really, if we're seeking to follow Christ. And it is this, preach the word of God. We must proclaim God's word. And in that is the gospel. We must proclaim the truth of God. We must be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. If you're sitting around always waiting for the right time, it's almost guaranteed it will never be the right time because you're going to find some reason it's just not right. But instead, we should proclaim God's word. We should be prepared, meaning ready to go of the right frame of mind and attitude and with a knowledge of the word in our hearts that it doesn't matter if it's favorable or not, we're ready to go. It can happen now. Now, part of that, and especially within the body, understand there is an aspect of patient correction, patiently correct. Because let's face it, even though we may, might like to think in our own minds that we're right all the time, the truth is we're not. We are sinful, broken people, redeemed and forgiven. 
but we're growing in godliness. We are being sanctified. We're not already there. So we need corrected and we need to be correcting. But when we do that, it needs to be done with patience. There needs to be some rebuking. Hey, when I'm out of line, I need somebody to rebuke me. And when you're out of line, you need somebody to rebuke you. Now, when the rebuke is happening, I I don't know of anybody that goes, wow, that was great. I got rebuked. That felt so good. No, we hate it. We're like, oh, man, who, who are you? Get out of my face. But the reality is we need that. And with maturity comes the ability to look back after the rebuke and go, yeah, yeah, I I needed that correction. I needed you to confront me with that. And I think the level of maturity we have is directly related to how short that distance between the rebuke and our acceptance of our need for it comes. I, I would pray in my own life that 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 gap gets shorter and shorter. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. See, Timothy is a pastor at Ephesus. And so all these things, although they're true for all believers, are especially true for a pastor. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Lay that good foundation. To not have that, well, gets you into all sorts of problems. In fact, those problems are what Paul goes on to talk about in the next few verses. So let's look at it. Verse three, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. Now, what's a myth? Well, there's a a genre called muthos, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about stories, fables, made up things, if you will, fairy tales to a certain extent in our modern vernacular. Why does he say all this? Because he's warning Timothy that, look, the reality is within the life of the church, there's a time coming. And I don't think he's necessarily talking about some some later time or, you know, uh, they believe they are in the end times and they are, I mean, it's after the ascension of Christ and we're waiting for the return of Christ. So we're in the end times. So that part's right. There is a time coming. I think in the natural life cycle of a group of believers, we see this time come a time coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Think about the nation of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. Under Moses' guidance, they had the, the Shekinah glory of God evident before them, leading them day and night. They had the, the tabernacle after that tent was constructed with the ark and, and Moses going in the meeting. And, you know, those, those episodes where they were scared of Moses and he had to cover his face because he literally glowed from having been in the presence of God. I mean, how much more affirmation do you need to know this is God and this is God's representative? And yet what did they constantly do? They'd get bored. Oh yeah, we're familiar with it. It was it was scary and kind of cool when his face glowed to begin with. But now, yeah, do we really have to listen to Moses? Is this really God talking? Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing and lumping together a whole lot of stuff that happened. But whether it be disease, the ground literally opening opening up and swallowing them, poisonous viper, you name it, God brought judgment after judgment on the people of Israel because their ears started to itch, because they no longer wanted to listen to sound doctrine and wholesome teaching. They wanted to follow after their desires, even if those desires weren't real. You know, when they said, hey, why why are we doing that? We're starving out here. Why don't we go back to Egypt? Egypt was so great. We had leeks and onions and we had pots of stew to eat and our bellies were full. It was awesome. Okay, yeah, they were killing our firstborn children and, you know, beating us sometimes to death. But other than that, it was awesome. You know, we get this delusional idea 
that what we desire is great and great for us. In fact, that's the deception that the devil uses. That's what makes sin look so enticing. Because without that enticing look to sin, we wouldn't go there. If sin just looked like suffering and death, I, I think we'd have the good sense to, to not go, hey, I want to try that. But we don't. It is, by its very nature, tempting. For time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. We love it when people tell us what we want to hear. In other words, affirm what we're already thinking. But do you see the stark contrast between that and patient correction, rebuke, and encouraging people with good teaching? They're the complete opposite. In fact, Paul says the the extreme in verse 4, when all of that itching ear satisfying by listening to the teachers that just tell them what they want to hear, you get the outcome. Verse 4, they will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. Chasing after myths. Hmm. You know, that reminds me of a TV show I used to watch called Mythbusters. Uh, You can Google it. But in that show, there is uh, one of the hosts of the show, uh, Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman were the hosts. I believe it was Adam had a comment he made in one of the uh, shows, or it may have been a t-shirt he was wearing, something to the effect of, I reject your reality and I substitute my own. Paul's essentially talking about people doing just that, rejecting reality, rejecting the truth, rejecting what is, and substituting their own idea of what should be, what they're comfortable with, what they like, what they want to hear. What's the problem with that? Well, it's just not reality. We don't have the privilege existing in reality, of rejecting the truth and substituting our own versions of it, something we're comfortable with. Instead, we have to embrace the truth and adjust our behavior, our actions, our viewpoints based on the truth. Sometimes that can be pretty challenging, but it's what we're called to do as followers of Christ. In verse 5, Paul picks up with this. He says, but you should be, excuse me, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. That clear mind is having a clear sense of the truth, of reality. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. What does that mean? It means that we don't shy away from what God has called us to and the job he has given us because of what it looks like it's going to be like. Oh, that's that's going to be hard. I don't want to do that. That's going to be uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. You're focusing on the wrong thing. If your focus is on following Christ, if your focus is on telling others this is the good news and fully carrying out the ministry that God has given you, then all that other stuff ceases to be the focus. Uh, You may have to deal with some of that. You may go through some of that on the way to the goal. But since those things or avoiding those things aren't the goal, they become much less, much less significant in accomplishing the task. And that task is to fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Verse six, as for me, this is Paul talking about himself. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. Now he's making reference there. Well, let me finish it. The time of my death is near. He's saying his life has, has reached its completement. It's, it's it's culmination. And he's using a terminology there that echoes back even to the commands of the old Testament for offerings being poured out like a drink offering. He's used that reference before. His life is being poured out like an offering before God. Mind you, this is the man that over in the 12th chapter of Romans said, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer yourselves as living sacrifices to God. He's looking at his life now going, I'm facing my death. And when I look at my life, I did. I lived it as an offering to God, an offering poured out in worship of God. Would that we could all say that as followers of Christ, as we near the end of our earthly lives, to look back and say, yeah, I've poured it all out for him. Wouldn't that be awesome? Verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. He's saying, look, I know this is what lies before me. I know that I've fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've remained faithful. And now I'm waiting on the prize, that crown of righteousness, that, that, that the laurels that will be given to me for winning this race, for completing the race. So I know the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me these things on the day of his return. But then he has to, has to draw a point there and say, but wait, and the prize, that prize that I'm going to receive, that I'm so excited I'm going to be getting, it's not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing, for all those that follow Christ, for all those that fight the good fight, finish the race, remain faithful, for all of them that prize awaits. So Paul's not gloating. He's celebrating. And not just for himself, he is celebrating on behalf of all that this applies to. What a great encouragement to us. Whatever we're facing, whatever we're struggling through, as we seek to live out that call of Christ to follow him, to proclaim his gospel, to build each other up, being mindful that his word and our encouragement to each other may involve some rebuke. It may involve some correction. That all of that is moving us towards a prize. And it is an awesome prize of the resurrection, of eternal life in the presence of God. Let's live for that day. Let's live like we're living for that day. Let's pick up in verse 9. Here we have a new section, if you will, in this chapter, in which Paul is, is making some final appeals to Timothy. In fact, here he's, he's appealing to Timothy to come visit him. And we have some indications here that Timothy's probably still in Ephesus. But Paul's asking him, come join me in Rome. Come encourage me. You get this sense that Paul is feeling... Although he's feeling excited, although there's a sense of completion and, and peace about his, his service to Christ through his life and that he is facing the end, he's also kind of lonely. He'd like to have people around him that support him and encourage him and build him up in this time. And so he's calling Timothy to himself. He says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life. And he has gone to Thessalonica. Now, we, we don't know a whole lot more about that situation, except Demas didn't like what it was going to cost him to be associated with Paul. So he took off. He deserted him. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Now, what's the significance there? Well, those two he probably sent to Galatia and, well, Dalmatia, maybe? So they're on a mission, but still they're not there to encourage him. He says, only Luke is with me. And yes, that's Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke and wrote the Book of Acts as well. That Luke. 
Now, Luke, by all indications, was probably a doctor, and that may be why he was staying with Paul, was to, to care for his physical well-being, but also he worked as Paul's scribe on a regular basis as well. We, we see some evidence of that. So there are probably several things going on, but Luke is the only one there with him. And he says, and this is interesting, if you think back over the history of it, bring Mark with you when you come. For he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Wait, let's roll that back a little. This is Mark, John Mark. Yes, Mark of Gospel of Mark. That Mark. Also, John Mark of the missionary journey, first missionary journey, nephew of Barnabas, uh, cut out partway through the journey. Paul was kind of upset about that. By the time second missionary journey, they split ways. Paul and Barnabas because Barnabas wanted to include John Mark in the journey. Yeah, that John Mark. Well, you see how a reconciliation has taken place. You see how Paul values Mark and sees him as an encouragement, a co-laborer in the ministry. When he says, Luke is the only Luke is with me and bring Mark with you when you come for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Isn't it awesome how even though we may have differences of views, differences of opinion, and even how God may lead us down different paths when we all are serving him, it still all fits together. When we are all seeking after him, he can still bring us back together and do incredible things. It's not all bad that Paul and Barnabas split ways because what you had come out of it was two separate missionary teams at work. That's not a bad thing. And here God has brought Paul and Mark back together. But he goes on. He sent, I, or he goes on to say in verse 12, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. This is the guy that was bringing the letter that Timothy's now reading. And when he says, I sent him to Ephesus, it wasn't just, I sent him with the letter. It's a, I sent him to fill in for you while you come to me, sort of a statement. And then 13, when you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus at Troas. Also bring my books and especially my papers or literally parchments. What does that tell us? Well, if Timothy was going to have to travel through Troas to get to Rome, then he was still at Ephesus. So we, we've got a pretty good idea of, of where Timothy was. He's still at Ephesus. And what does Paul need the coat for? Well, he needs the coat because winter's coming and he's in prison. And let's just face it, Roman prisons weren't exactly well heated. In the wintertime, they get a bit nippy. So, you know, bring my coat, but there's more than that. Bring my books, especially my papers. He's saying, bring, bring the letters, bring the writings. Um, these may be books of scripture. There may be manuscripts of, of, well, what we know as some of the New Testament. I mean, it, this was important stuff. And Paul's like, I, the coat's a practical thing. So is the rest of it. But I want it here with me. I had to leave it there. But I want it here with me. So there we have it. That's the encouragement. And now he shifts to giving a warning. Now the warning starts in verse 14. In 14, he says, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. Now you kind of pick up there that there's more going on. It wasn't just Alexander spoke out against Paul. In fact, many scholars are kind of of the opinion, although it's not overtly stated here, that Alexander may have had a hand in Paul's arrest that he's now sitting in prison for. So whatever it was, this is more than just a, hey, this guy's going to give you trouble. It's a watch out for this guy. He did me much harm. And the Lord's going to judge him for it. I mean, he'll, he'll stand accountable before God. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. Then Paul shifts to talking about a trial. Now, 
here he he references the first time I was brought before the judge. You may think, oh, well, that his that's his previous Roman imprisonment, or that's back, you know, the Felix Festus bit as we go back and read Acts and and remember those accounts. That doesn't seem to be what was going on here. The normal mode for a Roman trial or a trial of a Roman citizen there in Rome would have been a, a preliminary investigation trial. You know, when, when they hadn't thoroughly investigated the charges, it was just the basic, we might think of it as an arraignment or, or, you know, kind of that indictment phase of things. And then there was the actual trial with sentencing that takes place later. Paul is right now existing in that gap between. And so he's making reference to that first part. Again, we, we think it's the first part of his trial associated with his current imprisonment. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everybody bailed. You know, whatever the situation, whoever was with him at the time, it was that sense of, of being alone. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. How many of us would say that? We're serving the Lord. We've got a group of people with us that are walking alongside us, that are part of things. And then you get arrested. And what happens? Suddenly you're alone. Does this sound familiar at all? As I'm recording this, we're only about less than two weeks out from Easter. Okay, can we think of anything echoed from the account of Holy Week here? Hey, you're one of this guy's friends. You you followed him. No, I don't know who you're talking about. Sound familiar? Yeah, Paul's saying, look, again, he's seeing his suffering as uniting him with Christ. He's seeing echoes of what Christ went through. Not that he has a Messiah complex or anything along those lines. He's just saying, hey, you know, in any way that this reflects what happened to Christ, that just brings me closer to him. And his response is very Christ-like. Everybody abandoned me. But then what does he say? May it not be counted against them. May God not hold them accountable for bailing on me. And then he focuses on what's really important in verse 17. He says, but the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety, before all the Gentiles to hear, and he rescued me from certain death. So here Paul is saying, look, everybody bailed on me, but God stood with me, and he let me stand there and proclaim the entirety of the gospel for the Gentiles to hear. He rescued me. Verse 18, yes, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely. Now, this is important. He'll deliver me from every evil attack and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Paul's not saying he'll bring me safely out of prison and I'll be a free man, or he'll bring me safely into a comfortable retirement, or he'll bring me safely. No. Those aren't the goal. Those are part of the journey. Yes, the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want to back up a little. And I want to focus on 17 because the end of 17, and he rescued me from certain death. The way this translation, which is the New Living translation, I I like the New Living. It's a pretty good rendering, and it makes me think about the way the scripture is translated. And he rescued me from certain death is actually more literally translated. He rescued me from the mouth of the lion. Now, the lion can represent Satan. It can represent death. It can represent a lion. And that may seem like I'm joking, but I'm not. During this day and age, it was not unheard of to face lions 
in the arena. And so Paul's saying, look, you know, he rescued me from getting thrown to the lions, whether that's literally or figuratively. Yeah, he still sees his death is coming, but it was staved off so that he could declare the gospel in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And that's an awesome thing. And in all of it, he says, this is all to the glory of God forever and ever. Amen. Now we come to the last few verses of Paul's final letter to Timothy. He says, Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the household of Onesiphorus. Now, that would have been in the area of Ephesus. So we get the idea that Priscilla and Aquila are in Ephesus. He's saying, give my greetings to them. Erastus stayed at Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. So he's saying, here are these people along the way you may encounter. You know, give them my greetings. Give them my encouragement. Verse 21. Do your best to get here before winter. Hmm, A little practical application there. Paul knows his time is limited, but he's also thinking, you're bringing my coat. Get here before winter. Okay. So do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus sends you greetings. And so does Pudens and Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. Now, literally translated as brothers, but it means brothers and sisters, all those in the family of faith. And you may say, well, why why brothers? Why can't they say brothers and sisters to begin with? Well, because the sisters would not have had legal standing. So that was a, in that society, a devalued position for Paul to refer to them all as brothers, including Claudia, who was a woman. Then that elevated her position to being equal to that of the guys. What do we know about these other guys? Well, uh, some of the early church fathers account Linus as being one of the first bishops or pastors of the church at Rome. Pudens is a name used in nobility. Uh, Affluent families in Rome would have used that name. That wasn't a name that commoners used. You know, so we, we see some of these characters. These aren't necessarily, even in their society, insignificant people. But these are all people who, well, send their greetings. They send their greetings, their encouragement. The idea is, okay, maybe Paul isn't all that alone, but the people he really wants closest, the people that are dearest to him, he wants there. He wants Mark. He wants Timothy. He has Luke, but these others are there, they're around and they send their greetings as well. Their encouragements as well. What can we learn from that? We need to learn from that, that it's not church. Isn't all about one person. Well, okay. It's all about Jesus who is so much more than one person, but in living out our Christian life, we all need to be an encouragement to each other. We all need to be building each other up, supporting each other, standing next to each other. And yeah, that involves correction sometimes, and it involves rebuke sometimes, but a lot of times it involves just being there. Just being there. Being an encouragement, standing with, not abandoning And Paul is mentioning all of these people who have shown their faith to be true by their steadfastness, who are giving greetings and encouragement. That should remind us as believers, we need to be doing that. We need to be together, encouraging even as I record this during a global pandemic, when so many of us are, are isolated and separate, we have tools at our disposal. We have technology like what I'm recording this podcast on that allow us to reach out and communicate with each other 
and encourage each other and build each other up. But we still have people we can talk to across a yard. Maybe our next door neighbors. Maybe we need to pick up a phone and call somebody and encourage them and remind them they haven't been abandoned and they're not alone. Then Paul finishes with verse 22. May the Lord be with your spirit and may his grace be with all of you. Now, this is a slightly different ending than Paul normally uses. It sounds similar, but he words it a little different. But he gives that encouragement to the Lord being with them, to build them up in their spirit. But then he says, and may his grace be with you all. Unlike the first letter to Timothy, which was intended to be read out loud in front of the church, this one has a much more personal flavor. And yet for him to say, may his grace be with all of you, indicates this one too was meant to be read out loud, to be an encouragement. Paul knew he was writing to more than just Timothy. And of course, God in inspiring him knew he was writing to generations and and millennia of believers to come. This is God's word. And it's for us as well as for Timothy. Take those encouragements that we find here. Apply them to your heart and your mind. Seek to live a life that finishes the race, that is faithful, that celebrates in the Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you that even though we may seem abandoned and and things may seem hopeless and and even pointless, that you have not left us, that you stand with us and you will give us strength to follow you. You will empower us with your indwelling presence to do what you have called us to do. Because without it being dependent even on our faithfulness or anyone else's faithfulness to us, you are faithful. You are can be trusted and counted on. And Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that you would forgive us where we have been unfaithful and that you will continue to show us your faithfulness. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.